Well, greetings to all of you. You know, running through the pumps and the pipes of our human anatomy is a life-giving substance that we call blood. It is the most critical ingredient of all human life support systems. In Leviticus 17.11, we read that the life of the flesh is in the blood. In an article I took off the internet, it says the average adult has about five liters of blood living inside their body, coursing through their vessels, delivering essential elements, and removing harmful waste. Without blood, the human body would stop working. Blood is the fluid of life, transporting oxygen from the lungs to body tissue and carbon dioxide from body tissue to the lungs. Blood is the fluid of growth, transporting nourishment from digestion and hormones from glands throughout the body. Blood is the fluid of health, transporting disease, fighting substances to the tissue and waste to the kidneys. Because it contains living cells, blood is alive. Red blood cells and white blood cells are responsible for nourishing and cleansing the body. Since the cells are alive, they too need nourishment. Vitamins and minerals keep the blood healthy. The blood cells have a definite life cycle, just as all living organisms do. When the human body loses a little bit of blood there, or through a minor wound, the platelets cause the blood to clot so that the bleeding stops. But when the human body loses an excessive amount of blood, then death can occur. So we see that the life is in the blood. Now back in Acts, the 17th chapter, in Acts 17, the Apostle Paul made an, an astounding or a startling statement. I know that many people today don't want to hear that. Many people today don't want to believe what Paul is saying. But let's notice back in Acts 17, and let's begin reading in verse 16. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. In other words, God had moved him and put it into his mind that he needed to do something. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And of course, uh, it was an idolatrous city. They worshipped the great statues of Diana and various other gods. They were always worshiping some other kind of god and making statues to the gods because they did not understand who the true god was. And so when you don't understand who the true god is, you're liable to worship just about anything. And you can also be deceived into believing just about anything. Look around you today at all the various religious organizations and the religious beliefs and the idolatrous beliefs that are extant in this world today. I'm convinced that human beings, no matter what their platform, no matter what their agenda, they will get someone to follow them. So verse 17 says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Of course, you know, the new covenant and the old covenant has a tremendous difference between the two. One was physical, the other is spiritual, and the Jews did not accept, or at least many of the Jews, did not accept the New Covenant, did not accept the Messiah, did not accept Jesus Christ and His teaching. So Paul was constantly going to the synagogues and was disputing with them, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that had met with him. So wherever Paul was, he was ready to preach the gospel, he was ready to explain it. Peter said we need to be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in us. Well, Paul always was ready to give an answer of the hope that was in him. Verse 18, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. Now these were the philosophers of the day. This was the intellect. This was the intelligentsia. This was academia, if you will. And they wanted to hear what this babbler had to say. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They had never heard that doctrine before. And so they wanted to know what this babbler, and of course the word comes from the, the Greek word means uh, one who picks up seeds like birds and picks up pieces of information and has to go forth and retell it somewhere. So they would meet in the marketplace, they would read in the, meet in these 
various forums and they would discuss certain concepts that were extant during that day. And they took him in verse 19 and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof you speakest is? Tell us more, if you will. For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Oh, sure, they wanted to know what he was talking about. Because it was new, it was different. And they were always wanting to know some strange and different thing. Verse 21, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Gossipers is what they were. Men who were ever learning, as, it, as Paul wrote to Timothy, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, you can go out here and study the philosophers of this world, and you're constantly learning different doctrines, different beliefs, and learning about the various other religious organizations of the world, but you're not going to come to the knowledge of the truth. All it's going to do is confuse you. So once you come to the knowledge of the truth, I would encourage you to stick to it and don't be dabbling off in other religions and trying to find out what they believe, trying to find out what their uh, concepts are, what their doctrines are. It'll confuse you. And the next thing you know, you'll be vacillating like a wind blown in the wind, or a reed, excuse me, blown in the wind. Verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Or what he was saying here is, you're very, very religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. In other words, they didn't want to leave any stone unturned. If there was a God out there they didn't know about, then this um, was directed toward him. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, uh, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein. Now he's beginning to introduce the concept of God the Creator. The, the evolutionary concept, or whatever it was they believed in the day, Paul was refuting it, and he is beginning to tell that there is a God who made the heavens and the earth. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. Now notice verse 26. And has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Did you, did you understand what Paul just said? He said he has made all the nations, all the men and women on this earth of one blood. Regardless of race or, na race, excuse me, or nationality, we are blood brothers. Indians, Pakistanis, Ethiopians, uh, Canadians, Mexicans, Spaniards, Italians, uh, Americans, Britons, we're all brothers related through the one blood. Now, Malachi said in Malachi 2 and verse 10, have we not one father? Who was he alluding to? Well, he was alluding to Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, we see that Adam was the first man. And of course, you go back to Genesis 3 and verse 20, and you see that Eve was the mother of all living. So we are one nation of one blood. So we share this common bond of all being blood brothers, if you will. I remember watching the old Western movies years ago where they talked about being blood brothers when a, a white man and a red man would make slits on their hands or their wrists, and then they would rub those, uh, that blood together, making them blood brothers. They were already of one blood. They just were different ra nationalities or different race, but the blood that was flowing through them was the blood that God put in them, of the fluids that I had mentioned to you in the introduction. So all mankind shares a common bond. Now in addition to that, we also share another bond. All men, all women, Everywhere, in every nationality, in every race, in every creed, we share another bond. And that bond is that we are all afflicted by a terminal spiritual disease called blood guiltiness. If you want me to define that in more basic terms, we're talking about sin. But guilty of shedding another person's blood. According to Webster's Third New International Dictionary, blood guiltiness is guilt resulting from the shedding of blood. Murder. Taking another person's life. 
Now, back in Ecclesiastes 7, in Ecclesiastes 7, and notice verse 20, in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20, It says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes came to the conclusion that there was not a just man on the face of this earth. Not one single human being that did not sin. He saw that. He understood that. Of course, he was writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Apostle Paul understood the same thing. In Romans 3, verse 23, we read, All have sinned. All. Now, you know, there's a lot of people that you would read that scripture to, and they would say, Oh, yes, all men are sinners. But deep inside their mind, deep inside the recesses of their mind, they don't really believe that they are a sinner. Because most people believe and want to believe that they are good. They have that concept somewhere embedded in their mind that they are good. Others might be sinners, but oh, no, not me. Well, the scriptures say that all have sinned. Every man, woman, and child have sinned. Now notice in Acts 2. Acts 2. And let's turn over to Acts 2 and verse 36. Now this was the day of Pentecost. This was after Jesus Christ of Nazareth had come to this earth, had formed his church, had selected his disciples, and had been crucified on a stake on the Passover day. Now this was the day of Pentecost. On the morrow after the Sabbath, during the days of unleavened bread, they had counted 50 days, and he had told them to assemble together on the day of Pentecost. And Peter, of course, along with the other disciples or apostles, had spoken on that day. But Peter's message was primarily recorded. And here's what he said in Acts 2 and verse 36. Now he had told them, uh, about Jesus Christ. He told them about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on that particular day. And now he was preaching to them. And here's what he said, verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel, everyone, and here he's relating to the house of Israel, but this scripture relates to every man, woman, and child. Know assuredly, know this, that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He said, you are guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Acts 3, in verse 11, we read a similar situation. And as the lame man, which was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Now God had poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, and he was allowing these apostles to perform miracles. And in order to draw the people to them, you see, miracles seems like it draws people. And we're going to see miracles by the false prophet. We're going to see miracles in the latter day by the two witnesses. And it just seems like that people look at these miracles and that's all they need is a miracle. And this must be of God. Now, we've got to be able to discern who's performing the miracles because God is going to allow Satan, the devil, to inspire the false prophet to perform mighty miracles in the last days that if it were possible, would deceive the very elect. So a lame man had been healed. And so he got the people's attention. They came running up to them in verse 12. When Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power? No, they didn't do it by their own power. They did it by the power of the Holy Spirit that they had received on the day of Pentecost. He said, it's not by our own, our own power or holiness. We had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. He says, you denied and you caused Jesus Christ of Nazareth to be killed. So you see, it wasn't just these men during this period of time that caused the death of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, sure, the Romans did the dirty work. But it was because of his own race, because of the lies that they had told, because they had gone in and selected false witnesses to testify against Jesus Christ, and then they put the political pressure on Pilate to make the decision to crucify Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But it was a mock trial, and he was put to death 
and he was without sin. But notice this. For those people who think that they had no part in the death of Jesus Christ, Christ magnified the law. He said, I come to magnify the law. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law. I'm not coming to destroy it. I'm coming to fulfill it. I'm coming to raise the physical law onto a higher level. And, of course, we'll see a little later on, he's going to write that law into our hearts and minds. In other words, he's going to put a new way of life into our mind, where we will become new creatures, a new creature in Christ. But that's another story. But we see in Matthew 5 and verse 21, it says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, You shall not kill. That was one of the Ten Commandments. You shall do no murder, is actually what it means. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. There was a death penalty in those days. Under the law, under the sacrificial law, under the, the Ten Commandments, that there was a law against murder. There was a capital punishment for that. But he said in verse 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Talking about Gehenna hell fire. And he's talking about a relationship that we as human beings have with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we know we're of one blood. So every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth is our brother and sister in Christ. We are all God's children. But he says, if you hate, if you harbor within your heart, within your mind, some type of hatred, some type of vengeance, some type of attitude that is contrary to the love of God, then you've already committed murder. So virtually every single one of us are guilty of that. Notice what it says in 1 John 3 and verse 14. 1 John 3 and verse 14. It says, We know that we have passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren, we love our brothers and sisters. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. In other words, he that has any hard feelings, he that has any hatred, any vengeance, anything that is contrary, as I said, to the love of God, then you have a death penalty hanging over your head. And there's no way of getting it out, getting out from under that. We read in Romans 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. So if you are harboring, some type of animosity, some type of hatred, some type of vengeance, then you're guilty of murder. Now, that's what bothers me. Uh, and, and as I deliver this message, I doubt very seriously at, that some of the people that this message should reach will listen to it. Because anything they get from me, it goes in the garbage, they beat it up with the hammer and they send it back to us. They don't want to receive anything from me for some particular reason. I have received letters from people that have labeled me as the biggest hypocrite in God's church. I've been called of Satan the devil, that my teaching and my preaching is of, of Satan the devil. I have been um, called on, on, on the phone and I've, I've had people tell me, take me off the mailing list, all that you're interested in is power and money. Um, you know, I've, re I've received a lot of emails and letters that are very scathing. Now, the point is that at first it bothered me, and I guess it still does. When you read something or you hear something where someone hates you. Now, now you understand the word I said is hate, because you see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when you write it down, and if you speak it, then that is the hatred and the vehemence coming out of your mouth that comes from the heart. Now, what bothers me is this. Those people were at once considered to be, many of them, good friends of mine. And they still are, as far as I'm concerned. I have no animosity. I have no hatred. I have no vengeance directed toward those individuals at all. In fact, I pray for them. I pray that God will forgive them for the thoughts that they have hidden in their heart. Because, you see, I know that if they continue and maintain that particular attitude toward me or to anyone else, they are guilty of shedding someone else's blood. They are guilty of murder, according to the Word of God. So I'm concerned about those types of individuals, and I do pray for them, and I pray that they can get past it. As we draw closer to the Passover, I would hope that they would examine their behavior, 
ex examine their attitude, and if, if they think that I'm wrong, then what they need to do is go to the Lord God Almighty and ask God to show me what I've done that's wrong and that I will repent, that they will be praying for me in my behalf. But don't send me hate letters. Don't send me scathing messages uh, calling me a liar, calling me a thief, calling me a hypocrite, telling me that I'm of Satan the devil because you are in danger of the judgment, not me. It's not my problem, it's yours. And so I'm asking that those people with that type of attitude will repent and turn to God and ask God to help me see my problems if I indeed have them. So notice Psalm 51 and verse 1. David cried out to God. He said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And believe me, brethren, if I have transgressed the law of God, if I have offended, if I have hurt, if I have maligned, if I have taken vengeance, if I have hurt or offended anyone in any way, I'm truly sorry. And I have repented to God of that. But I can't change my mind just because someone develops a particular opinion about me. I have to go to the Word of God, and I have to discern what is right and what is wrong. And regardless of what man feels about me, I must do what God shows me to do according to His Word. So in discerning between right and wrong, if I see that I have done wrong, then I will repent. And I have repented on numerous occasions. He said, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I hope you realize that on a continuous basis, your sins are right before you as well. I hope you come to see that. I hope you come to recognize that you are a transgressor of God's holy, righteous law on a daily basis. You know, repentance is a continuous thing. It's when we stop repenting that we're getting into trouble. You know, I constantly am looking at myself and examining myself, and I see things that I don't like, things that I despise. And don't think for one moment that I don't go to God and ask Him to help me overcome those. You know, I see many of my faults and my flaws, and I can see many of yours. But I don't come and tell you. I don't chastise you. I don't ridicule you. I don't send you a letter and pray that you'll be cast into the lake of fire. No, no. I pray that God will help you see what your problems are and that you will overcome them, that you will turn. As Ezekiel said, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die, O house of Israel? All you have to do is see your mistakes and repent of them. Now notice verse 14. David, who had indirectly murdered blood guiltiness, he had murdered Uriah the Hittite. No, he didn't take the sword. He didn't slay Uriah, but he plotted, and he planned, and he schemed, and he knew that Uriah the Hittite would be put right in the face of the battle, right where the, the strongest of the uh, opponent's soldiers would be, and he knew that he would be killed. Once you were put in that particular situation, you, it was almost sudden death, or sure death. And so he knew that. And he said in verse 14, Deliver me from blood, blood guiltiness, O God, you God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. He knew that he was guilty of murder, and he repented of it, and he changed. Because he understood. He understood what sin was. And he slipped, he made a mistake, a drastic mistake, and yet God forgave him of that. David knew that he was guilty of murder, and so were we. Now, I hope that we know that as well. Individually, every single one of us, just as sure as those Roman soldiers nailed Jesus Christ to the stake and rammed those spikes into his wrists and into his feet and hung him on that stake, and just as sure as that Roman soldier went by with that huge spear with a, with a head on it about a foot long and rammed it into his side, and the water and the spleen and his blood come gushing forward, you and I are just as guilty of doing that, individually and collectively as a human race. For you see, we all are guilty of the murder and the death of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now notice in Isaiah 53. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, I want you to notice down in verse 11. Isaiah 53 Verse 11, it says, He shall see of the travail of his soul. It's talking about Christ here. 
Read this entire chapter if you have the opportunity and the time. And shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. By his righteousness. Because Christ was sinless, it was by his righteousness that he would justify, make clean, many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Now he's talking about you and he's talking about me. Jesus Christ was going to bear our sins because we were murderers, because we were fornicators, because we were adulterers, because we had served other gods and trampled underfoot God's holy, righteous laws. Therefore, in verse 12, will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul, his life, and the life is in the blood. So we see that his blood was poured out unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus Christ of Nazareth died for us. Now, the majority of people that are listening to my message here today are members or potential members of the body of Christ. Now, if you have repented of your sins, if you have been baptized, immersed totally in a watery grave, and had hands laid on you, and you received the gift of the Holy Spirit, then you have been be begotten by God, and you're on your journey toward the kingdom of God. Now, if that scenario fits you, if you have truly, and I mean truly repented, of trampling under the Ten Commandments, I'm talking about all ten of them, if you knew the need for baptism to, to forgive you of all your past sins, if you have done that, I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians 6 and notice something. In 1 Corinthians 6, a very profound statement was made here, and it should send shockwaves throughout our bodies when we read it or even when we, we think about it and come to comprehend it. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? You see, once you repent and are baptized and have hands laid on you, God actually puts His spirit or a portion into your mind, and the, the mind, the spirit that is in man unites with the spirit of God that enables you to understand spiritual things. So he says, the spirit of God is in you, and this, this body, this physical body, is like a temple, and God is dwelling in that temple, dwelling in your mind to help you, as we read back in John 14 and 16, he said, I will send you the comforter, and the comforter was nothing more than the Holy Spirit, and he will teach you all things. So you see, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it says, and you are not your own. See, we are not, at this point in time, once God begins to dwell in us, we become servants to God. We no longer can serve our own desires, our own whims, our own selfishness, our own vanity and pride. We have to overcome that. And notice what it says, for you are bought with a price. You see, the price that you and I were bought with, redeemed back, reconciled to God, was the death of a perfect, perfect human being. One who was God, who was the creator of the universe, who actually created man and caused the blood to begin flowing through his body so that he could live. And we caused the death of him. So, yes, there was a tremendous price that had to be paid. So you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The spirit came from God. It's his. Now notice 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. Peter who denied Christ. Peter who stood in the distance. And he watched as the Roman soldiers forced Jesus Christ of Nazareth to put that tree that had been cut down on his shoulders and began to drag it through the streets, dragging it to the place that they were going to crucify him. And he watched, and he slithered through the crowd, and he got a glimpse of Christ, and he denied him three times. This Peter finally come to understand what Christ was dying for. In 1 Peter 1, and notice verse 18. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conduct. That is conduct laden with sin. You received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And he died for us. 
And that was foreordained, it says in verse 20, before the foundation of the world. But he's made manifest to them in the last days for you and for me. Yes, Jesus Christ had to die. It was foreordained because God the Father knew in advance. He already knew what human beings would do. Without and separate from the Holy Spirit, he understood fully what we would do. So you see, our sins have estranged us from the Father. We have been cut off because of our sins. In Isaiah, the 59th chapter, in Isaiah 59, let's notice verse 1. Isaiah 59, verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. No, the Lord's hand is not shortened because the psalmist said, Where can I go from your spirit, O Lord? If I go out into the depths of space, you are there. If I go down into the depths of the sea, you are there. If I go down into the earth, you are there. For you see, radiating from God is this energy that God has transformed this tremendous spiritual power that actually permeates eternity. Wherever you go, God's Spirit is going to be there. And so God is able to perform miracles. He's able to perform His work through the power radiating from Him, transferring that into some type of energy. And by the word of His mouth, He is able to cause things to happen. Whatever it might be, nothing with God is impossible. So we see that the Lord's hand is not shortened. Absolutely not. God's presence is everywhere. It is in your home. It is in your automobile. It is there with you wherever you may be hunting in the woods, on your way to work, at the post office, down at the shopping center, when you're all alone totally, maybe out at night, gazing up into the stars, into the heavens. God is always there. That it cannot save. Yes, God can save. God can intervene at any particular time. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. God can hear any particular thing at any particular time. But he says, your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You see, our iniquity separated us from God. So remember, if you hate your brother, your hands are defiled with blood. You have been stained with the blood guiltiness. We are guilty of murder. So our iniquities, our sins, have separated us from God. We were all separated from God. Sin had erected an impenetrable wall between God and his human children. And only the price of blood could tear down that wall and reconcile man back to God. Notice Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. And let's read verse 22. Hebrews 9 and verse 22. It says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission, no forgiveness of sin. You see, it's imperative that blood be shed. Now, I don't know why God designed it that way, but he certainly did. And he designed it in such a way that the only way that sin could be purged, sin could be forgiven, would be through the shedding of blood. But what man's blood could he use? Because all had sinned. And the only way that sin can be blotted out was through a perfect sacrifice. So not any man on the face of the earth could qualify. Now, God did use animals for a particular period of time to make you sanctimonious clean, but it did not blot out the sin of murder. It did not blot out the wages of sin, which is death. Notice Hebrews 10 and verse 4. Hebrews 10 and verse 4, it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. No, it had to be a perfect sacrifice. Now, Jesus Christ performed the impossible. If you'll notice over in Matthew 27, Matthew 27, because man had been cut off from God, there was an, an impenetrable wall between God and man. Man did not have access to the Father. The Father will not be in the presence of sin in no way. That is why that Jesus Christ, as he hung there on the stake, right up at the end, he, he, he proclaimed, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in all of eternity, and for the 33 and a half years that Christ walked in this earth, this earth he always had 
the presence of God with him. But all of a sudden, he felt completely and totally alone. Why was that? Well, it was because at that particular period of time, all the sins of mankind were being poured out upon the Savior. He was bearing those sins upon himself. Just as that goat that we read about or read about back in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement, when that goat for the people was sacrificed and they put all the sins of the people upon that goat. Then Jesus Christ was a type of that goat. Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ bore the sins of many. And at that particular period of time, the Father turned his back on him and he went off into eternity and he left him alone. Christ wasn't ready for that. He had never been without the presence and the power of God Almighty because God will not tolerate sin. And so, therefore, it had to be a perfect sacrifice. And that's why no man could qualify. The blood of animals and goats, tens of thousands would not blot out our sins. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. Notice in Matthew 27 and verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost or yielded up the spirit. The spirit went back to God from which it came. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two for the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Tremendous events were taking place at that particular period of time. There in the temple, it began to shake. It began to, to quiver and the accoutrements and the Ark of the Covenant and the many accessories that were there in the temple began to rock and to shake and the, the earth began to uh, just quiver and, and it was dark outside and it was thundering and lightning and there was weirdness taking place. Heavenly signs were being experienced. And at the particular period of time, you know when you went into the temple, there was the holy place where the priests went in on a daily basis to perform the sacrifices, but there was the, the curtain that separated the holy place from the holiest of holies. And only one time during the course of the year did the high priest go behind the curtain into the holy place. And on this particular period of time, that curtain rent in two, separating it, thus allowing, through the blood of Jesus Christ, mankind to go directly to the throne of God. He was reconciled. He had been justified. He had been made clean. His sins had completely been blotted out through the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The barrier between man and the Father was removed. Notice Hebrews 9. In Hebrews 9, and let's read verse 12. Hebrews 9 and verse 12. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. What did Christ's shed blood do for us? When he went into the Father, and of course you know when he was resurrected there on that Sabbath afternoon, and the next morning early when the women went out, he said, Touch me not, I haven't ascended to my Father. And then he ascended to the Father, was accepted as a supreme sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, then came back to this earth. And in so doing, anyone who acknowledges the blood of Jesus Christ, accepts the blood of Jesus Christ, follows the criteria, and receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, you have eternal redemption. You don't ever have to worry about the death penalty hanging over your head ever again through the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Romans 5. In Romans 5, let's notice verse 8. Romans 5, do, verse 8. It says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified, simply means made clean, past sins blotted out, and how? By His blood we shall be saved from wrath, death, the death penalty removed, the wages of sin is death, sin is the transgression of the law. Through the blood of Christ our past sins were forgiven through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by His death, removing the veil, opening the veil, opening the way, giving us access to the Father. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now notice John, the third chapter. John 3, very familiar scripture. You can all probably quote it. For God so loved the world, the cosmos, the society, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave His only Son so that He could blot out the transgressions, 
blot out the sins of many, of all of mankind, so that he could reconcile them back to him. Now, is there anyone that does not want to inherit eternal life? Is there anyone that wants to perish? Because it says, so they would not perish. Do you want your sins blotted out? Well, I think the answer to that question is, well, of course I do. Well, what are the requirements? Hebrews, the 10th chapter. In Hebrews 10, it's simple, and yet it's very, very difficult. It's simple when you read it, but it's very difficult when you have to do it. You see, Hebrews 10 and verse 16, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Eternal. I will put my laws into their hearts or into their minds, will I write them. You know, the decisions that you make will be based upon God's laws. That's what he's saying here. I will put my laws into your mind so that when you have to deal with various situations, you will make decisions based upon my laws, not based upon your own carnality. Based upon your own desires, you will be able to discern right from wrong, and you'll be able to make the right decisions because my laws, you will never have any other gods before you. You'll never transgress the Sabbath day. You'll never even think about murder. You won't contemplate adultery. You won't covet anything. You won't bear false witnesses against your neighbor. No, you will observe all those laws because they're written in your heart and mind. That's the way you think. That's what you contemplate on. That's the way you act. That it motivates your motives, your entire way of life. You become a new creature, if you will, in Christ. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So once you have repented, once you have asked God to truly forgive you of transgressing His laws, there's no more offering for sin. There's no need for Christ to die again for you. He's already done it once. So we read in, in verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. It was through the blood of Jesus Christ that our sins were blotted out. Now, it says that this covenant, it mentions a covenant. So anyone that God calls in John 6, 44, He says, No man can come to me unless the Father draw him. So when the, the Father begins to call, and it's reflective on the parable of the sower. The sower sows the various seeds. Some seed go by the wayside. Some fall on stony ground. Some don't take very much root. Some fall among the thorns and the thistles and they don't grow. Some produce fruit. So you begin to see that God begins to call people. Those that act upon it and through the goodness of God, some He will lead to repentance. Some of them will see a need to repent of their past sins and they will receive the Holy Spirit of God. Now what you do at that particular period of time when God leads you to repentance, when God shows you that you need to be baptized, that you need the gift of the Holy Spirit before you can fully put on and develop the mind of God. Romans 8 9 says, unless you have the Spirit of God in you, you are none of His. So you see, that's the criteria. In order to enter into a new covenant with God, and every single individual must do this on an individual basis. And you look at the entirety of mankind that is of one blood, and of one mind, they have to come to a point where they acknowledge the blood of Jesus Christ, they accept His sacrifice, they repent of those sins, and they have hands laid on them, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you enter into a covenant, an agreement with God Almighty. That's between you and Him. And you're saying, Sir, I am sorry for the sins that I have committed. I'm sorry for committing the death of your beloved son. I'm sorry for walking all over my neighbors. I'm sorry for transgressing your holy righteous law. I want to change. And God, through the Holy Spirit, enables you to embark on a process called conversion, depicted by the seven days of unleavened bread, where you put leavening, which is a type of sin, out of your life, you come out of Egypt, which is another type of sin, and you begin working toward the heavenly Jerusalem, new Jerusalem. You become a new creature in Christ. Now, Hebrews 10 and verse 29. It says, Of how much sore punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. What is he talking about here? What is this blood of the covenant? Well, in Matthew, the 26th chapter, 
In Matthew 26, Jesus Christ assembled His disciples together on the evening of the 14th, the evening portion, and in Matthew 26, He told them some very specific things. Notice verse 26 specifically. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. You know that those of you that have been in the church of God understand that He is instituting new symbols on the Passover evening. And He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink you all of it. This cup of wine, oinos, this cup of fermented uh, grape juice that had been fermented and turned into wine, had alcoholic content in it. He says, for this, this wine that you are partaking is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What he was saying here was this. He was saying that you must partake of this wine, which is symbolic of accepting my shed blood before you can enter into a covenant agreement with me. Now notice 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, and let's notice verse 16. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. It says, The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? What he was saying here is, we are all sharing in the blessing of the blood of Christ. All of us that have accepted, that have acknowledged the, acknowledged the blood of Christ, have repented of our sins, we're all sharing in that blessing, the blood of Christ. What blessing? Well, the doing away with our death penalty that was hanging over our head, freeing us from that liberating us, if you will, setting us free, enabling us to embark on a life that we don't have to worry about death anymore, coming out of this world and being new creatures in Christ. Now flip over to 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized, put into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now here he's talking about the church. All the people that have accepted and acknowledged the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he was telling them in 1 Corinthians 10. We're all able to enjoy the blessing of the blood of Christ, that we can be uh, free of our sins. And after receiving the Holy Spirit, then we become a member of the body of Christ through that one eternal Spirit that flows from God Almighty into each one of us. That's why we all have so many things in common. That's why we understand these same basic truths and these same basic doctrines. That's why we can walk together, because we are all baptized into one body, immersed, put into the body of Christ, which is the church. So we've all been made to drink of that one Spirit. It's a fantastic and it's an absolutely wonderful thing. Now Passover, by the time you hear this, will be coming up soon. It is imperative that each one of us begin to examine ourselves and to understand about the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, we are one nation. We are all one of blood. We are all creatures of God. We are all potential sons of God. So we all have this one blood flowing through us. So we have that similarity. But those that are come into the knowledge of the truth, and God would have that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And He will give everyone an opportunity at some point in time to accept the blood of Jesus Christ, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and to become a part of that one body. So you see, instead of being one physical body united by one blood, we will all be one part of a spiritual body united by the Spirit of God, and we will go from from physical over into spirit. It says that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so we see in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 49, it clearly says, As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So you see, the one body will one day become a spiritual body called the family of God. And it will all be made possible through one man's blood.